This is the Ramana Maharshi Self-Knowledge Satsang, a time for self-reflection and self-inquiry. Know yourself and be always free and at peace. Welcome. I'm Richard Clark, hosting this Satsang. I'm a seeker like you sharing what we love. I've been blessed with years of deep teaching. So in this satsang, I bring this to you. The background image today is Ramana sitting with a dog at Skandan Ashram. This would have been, I think, in the early days there, maybe 1915, Ramana, would have been about 35 years old. Ramana had lived down the hill at Virapaksha Cave for about 15 years. Uh, Virapaksha did not have year-round water, though, so one of Ramana's devotees, Kanda Swami, took it upon himself to build a new place higher up the mountain next to a perpetual spring. It was built in front of a small natural cave, and it looked like this. Here is Canon Ashram, how it looks today. Carol and I would climb up the hill to Scandon Ashram frequently when we lived there. In the mornings, a swami would open up the ashram and enter the small cave, light an oil lamp for Ramana, and then chant. Here is a short sample. Now we loved this and some of our best meditations were in Skandan Ashram after the Swami's chant. We would sit and meditate and it was a very good time. Now this series is a paragraph by paragraph review of Ramana's seminal book, Who Am I? The All Text Version edited by Ramana himself. This week we're on paragraph 21 and Ramana's words. Like breath control, meditation on form, incantations, invocations, and regulation of diet are only aids to control of the mind. Through the practice of meditation or invocation, the mind becomes one-pointed. Just as the elephant's trunk 
which is otherwise restless, will become steady if it's made to hold an iron chain, so that the elephant goes its way without reaching out for any other object. So the ever restless mind, which is trained and accustomed to a name or a form through meditation or invocation, will steadily hold on to that alone. Now, in this paragraph, Ramana continues with his response to the question, are there no other means for making the mind quiescent? I think he thought this was a significant question that cut to the heart of what he had to say about spiritual practice. In the two previous paragraphs, he talked about breath and breath control. Now Ramana continues with other forms of meditation. The issue with all of these is that while they can cause the mind to pause, they do not bring it to its final stop. The issue with all of these is not with the practices, but rather with what underlies them. They all use the mind to try to stop the mind. Now remember, Ramana equates the mind and the ego. They are the same thing. So to stop one is to halt the other. All these meditations try to get at this by pausing the mind. In this pause, maybe you will see what is behind the mind. When the practice is done, though, then the mind becomes active again. At a deep level, this practice affirms the seeming reality and primacy of the mind. The mind is both the aim and the tool of practice. Ramana instead tells us to know who and what we are, and by this come to see the mind was never real to begin with. It's only consciousness. What is real has to be something that is always. Reality does not stop and start. It is always. The mind and thoughts come and go. There's nothing permanent about the mind. Now, the mind is always known. It is this knowing that is always. It is this knowing that is permanent. There is a dichotomy in spiritual practice between purification and deep practice. As an example from Chan Buddhist days in the early years in China, the time of Huainang, the sixth patriarch of Zen, this dichotomy played out. The fifth patriarch, Damon Hongren, told his followers that soon he would declare his successor. He wanted them each to write a verse that expressed the depth of their understanding. The outstanding student, the one who everybody thought would be the successor, wrote, the mind is a perfect mirror. We must keep polishing it to keep dust from settling on it. Hua Nang wrote in response, where is there for dust to light? Hua Nang got the master's bowl and robe, signs that he was the patriarch now. 
as long as meditation is on an object, will the meditator be brought to the non-objective? Meditation is mental and using concentration on an object or a sensation to stop other thoughts, concentration is only effective so long as it remains. Can any form of concentration be continuous? Can, this, can the meditator continue to concentrate in his dreams, in deep sleep? These various practices can strengthen the mind, improving one's ability to direct the mind. Concentration is not a substitute for inquiry, though. It is preparation. Now some notes about practice. As you learn that you can direct the mind, something else starts to happen. You learn that you can make choices that turn the mind more within that bring you a sense of peace, a sattvic mind. Now you are making use of the mind in ways that work to enhance your own spiritual practice. This is an important lesson. You can start to create new habits, habits of looking within, of self-inquiry, to replace the old habits of looking to the world for happiness. Where do you find happiness? It is always within. Now to our videos for the week. First is Swami Sarva Priyananda. He is going to explain consciousness in 200 seconds. It is consciousness. Chaitanyam. The word is Chaitanyam in Sanskrit or Chit. Chaitanyam, Chit, these are the words used. And what he says is, there is a consciousness in you. This is Chaitanyam. And you have a mind and you have a body. This consciousness shines in the mind and through that in the body, in all the organs of the body and you feel this consciousness. This is the answer. Now the answer here is, the thing to be noted here is, the teacher presents consciousness in five aspects. There's five points you have to understand appreciate. First of all, consciousness is not a part of your body or your mind. Consciousness is not a part of your body or your mind. It is apart from your body and mind. Here it is different from science because modern science would say consciousness is a product of your body. Even your mind is a product of your body. Mind and consciousness all are products of the brain. That is what physiology would say today. But here the teacher says, consciousness is apart from your mind and body. First point, it is not a part of your body. It is not a product of your body. Second point, it is apart, but it pervades and illumines the mind and body. Consciousness pervades and illumines the mind and body, enabling it to function. Third point, this consciousness is not limited by the mind and body. It exists apart from the mind and body also. It is not limited to it. It is not something here in this particular brain, you know, in this part of the body. It is not limited by the body. Third, this consciousness is known, it is known in the functioning of the mind and body. The functioning, through the functioning of the mind and body, we can know consciousness, we can experience consciousness. And fifth, the last point to be appreciated is, without the mind and body, consciousness is still there, but it cannot be known. It is not experienced. Example, five points, I will give you an example. There is light here from these tube lights, there is light here. 
here is my hand and light is being reflected from this hand, okay. it is being reflected from this hand. The light which is being reflected from this hand, you can see here, the light being reflected from this hand, the light is not a part of this hand, it is not a product of this hand. Okay. First point. The second point is, it pervades the hand and illumines the hand. Third point is, I can understand the light, a third point is, it exists it is not limited by the hand, other than the hand also it exists everywhere. And the fourth point is, it is by the reflection in, the, in this hand that I can understand the light. Just now here I cannot understand the light. But when I put my hand here and it shines, I can understand the light, I can experience the light when it is reflected. And the last point very interesting is, if I remove the hand, the light is still there, but it is not experienced. Now it is experienced, now it is not experienced. We are next Rupert Spira. Who says the mind Attention knowledge is, is the mind. Reality. Try. How would you, when you pay attention to something, you always give your attention to an object. Yes. Try now to give your attention to something that isn't that has no objective qualities. It's not possible. No. So attention can only stand when it is directed towards an object. The mind, because the mind is our power of attention. It, if you try to think of something that has no objective qualities, you can't do it. The mind can only stand as mind if it pays attention to something. That is why the traditional progressive path gives the mind a mantra to attend to. The teaching realizes that it's not possible to attend to our true nature. It's not possible to direct our attention towards pure consciousness because we can only direct our attention towards an object. As I said in the meditation, the word attention comes from the Latin a, meaning to or towards, and tendere, meaning to stretch. The attention is always stretched towards something. Attention is a stretch from its source, pure awareness, towards the object. And the object is always something other than itself. The mind cannot pay attention to its source. It can only pay attention to something that is not itself. That is why the mind's knowledge is always in duality. I know such and such. I love you. I see the house. I directing its attention towards you or it, an object. It's the only way the mind can know in subject object relationship. But the mind can't turn around on itself and know itself and remain as the mind. In fact, if the mind tries to do that, it ceases to be mind and is revealed as pure consciousness. In other words, the knowing with which the mind knows, whatever it knows, is made out of consciousness. But your analogy was, was a good analogy. It is as if pure consciousness is refracted or reflected through the mind. And it's only when consciousness is reflected through the mind that it can know something other than itself. For consciousness to know itself, it doesn't need to rise in the form of the mind. It knows itself by itself. It is self-shining. But in order to know something other than itself, 
such as an object, person, or world. Awareness needs to cease shining on itself. It needs to cease looking at itself and rise in the form of the mind. It's only as the mind that consciousness can turn away from itself and shine on the object. Therefore, at the origin of everything the mind knows is the belief, I am a temporary finite consciousness. Only a temporary subject could know a finite object. So in order to know something finite or perceive something finite or love someone finite, we first have to believe and feel that I am a separate consciousness. That is why the separate I thought is at the heart of all the mind's knowledge. Everything the mind knows is predicated upon the separate I thought. And that is why in this approach, we don't deal with all the things, the innumerable things that the mind knows. We deal with the single belief that is at its origin. Because if that belief tends out, turns out to be faulty, then everything that the mind knows will turn out to be faulty also, or at least relative, if not faulty. So here we, we question the validity, or we, we investigate this knowing I, the I that seems to know, and this turning around of the attention, which starts with the question, what is this I, who am I? So it, it's initiated very often by a question, but it's not followed by a line of reasoning. It's followed by being aware, giving our attention to the experience of awareness, giving our attention to the experience of being aware, which means being aware of being aware. Thank you. That's, that's useful. Um, can I just build on that, sure. yeah. please? The analogy of the sun and the moon and how the moon borrows the sun's light was very good and very clear. And, and you also said that pure awareness in its pure state is before it mixes with anything. Um, so I just want to be clear about this. So pure awareness with attention, it's like the attention makes it impure or with mind, it makes it impure. Yes, you see, in order to, you, you, you're right. In order for, for awareness to pay attention to something, that something must be an object, yes? You yes. can't pay attention to something that's not an object. Yes, yes. And that object is, by definition, separate from yourself. You can only pay attention to something that is over there. Yes. Yeah? Now, in other words, the object is finite. It's separate from you. Yes? Yes. Now, in order to pay attention to a finite object, you must first imagine yourself to be a finite subject. Right. Only a finite subject can know a finite object. In other words, pure awareness doesn't know a finite object directly. Because pure awareness is infinite. There are no, from awareness's point of view, there are no divisions within itself. Mm. There are no finite objects within itself. Because if a finite object was to appear in awareness, awareness would have to be finite. Because the object is something other than itself. Yeah? Mm, yes. So pure awareness doesn't know an object. In order to know an object, it must rise in the form of the mind, the subject of experience. Yes. And now we will listen to Nomi as Nomi asks, by what light?
By what light do you know that you exist? What knows? Certainly the knowledge of your existence does not depend upon a body. What knows? The senses do not know it. It knows the senses, but the senses do not know it. What knows? How do you know that you exist? It is not due to thought. It knows thought, but remains unknown by thought. What knows? How do you know that you exist? You must exist in order to know it. Indeed, the knowledge and the existence are inextricable. They are identical. When you are happy, what knows the happiness? It knows itself. The perfect fullness of existence is self-knowing. If you yearn to realize the truth, what so yearns? The reality is self-known.
Evidently, the unreal cannot know the real, for the unreal does not exist. The real comprehends itself, not by sensation, not by conception, not by anything objective whatsoever. The only veiling of the innate perfection is misidentification, which alone constitutes ignorance. Such misidentification is not a second reality not a second self. It is just misidentification, delusion, the self of imagination. Inquire within, who am I? What is the self that actually exists? What is the nature of the inquirer? In existence, there is no multiplicity. In true knowledge, there is no differentiation. The self is existence alone. True knowledge is consciousness alone. If you suppose that you are apart from that, Who is it that so supposes? Have a keen interest in self-knowledge. For in this lies peace, happiness, 
and freedom from all of the imagined bondage. Listen, reflect, meditate, remain absorbed. Thus you will know the self, and what you know is what you are. What you appear to have you may lose, but what you are is forever. just as existence is unborn and imperishable. So is this knowledge. Without beginning and without end. From the viewpoint of the assumed individuality or ego, It may appear enigmatic or perplexing as to how this can be. From that perspective, one thinks of knowledge as something possessed or something that occurs. But self-knowledge and truth is identical to the self that is known. It neither comes nor goes. It is indivisible and undifferentiated. Such is timeless truth. That timeless truth, that supreme Brahman, is what indeed you are. And what you are, you are always. What you are not, you are never. So then, what exists? The self exists, but it cannot be known objectively, as if you were one thing and the self were another. After all, what is being indicated here is yourself. What knows? By what light do you know that you exist? Now we will have a 
short time for inquiry. Breathe in and breathe out. Notice the breath as it comes in, as it goes out. Take long, slow breaths. Now, notice that you exist. You exist and you know that you exist. Now, inquire, investigate within yourself. What just comes and goes? And what is always there? always the same within you. How can you be anything that comes and goes? Do you come and go? Who am I? What is the nature of my existence? All right, let's close with a short chant. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. If this soft song was of interest to you, I have more, a free book site, a YouTube site, and my blog. The URLs will be on the screen next. These soft songs will continue in the following weeks with this series based on the Ramana Maharshi book, Who Am I? Thank you for letting me share this teaching with you.